Can you hear that? I can. Okay.
this song kind of fades into something else. <laughs> okay. Like right here or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just want to show a little bit of this screen so people can see what we're looking at. Uh -huh. some piano in a moment. My wife slips me notes under the door. <laughs> He's bewitching a little bit, this guy. That is really cool, what you're doing. Wow. <laughs> Well, okay, so this is already at nine minutes, so I want to talk, but um, sure. boy, um, <clears throat> that is wonderful. I, you know, I have tuned in, but I, I have to admit I haven't seen all of that. I must have tuned out else as well. But um, my, my guest is Brian Charette. He lives Hello. in New York. And it, you live in New York, right? I live in New York. I'm in the East Village right now. He's in the East Village, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and but Michael Barsamanto says hello. Hello. <laughs> Do you know Michael? I don't. He's Do a great drummer. And Is he, he in, from here? He lives in LA, but he's played with a bunch of interesting people. And um, we may have we may have met there. I don't always remember the last names. You could have met, and you guys would like each other yeah, very. Hi, uh, hi, Michael. Nice yeah. to meet you here. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, Michael. He's been a guest on on the show too. Uh huh. Um, I miss well, being in LA extremely. <laughs> I, well, I have so I you know my list is really long. Of course, I can't see my list because it's on my hard drive that died, and uh -huh. luckily I have a backup. But um, <clears throat> but I'm I'm waiting for that, you know, because I I kind of have this fear in the back of my mind that I'm not doing something that I should be because I. I can't see it on my hard drive, <laughs> uh -huh. but I know I'm going to get it all back because I had the whole time machine. So, uh -huh. uh, God. Anyway, 
Um, that I've never heard you do anything like that. I've I'm much more familiar with you, like at the baked potato. Sure. Um, you know, playing. I just play. An, I play organ or piano. Yeah, yeah and just kind of hard kick-ass jazz you know edgy stuff um this stuff is really to me very exciting i'm excited about it too i mean i've had a lot of time to get it together it's all i the only kind of artistic thing that i've really been working on really have is you, doing these have you been this this style have you been oh, I'm sure it's not only this year, but I'm sure it's more this year, but have I actually, you been working on it a while? I actually did more of this in the beginning than playing jazz. Like in my 30s, oh. I was a producer and an electronics kind of person. I did a lot with keyboards before I became super serious about playing Hammond organ. Huh. I always I always played jazz and always played Hammond, but I was almost working in the production side of things a little bit earlier. That makes sense to me. Yeah. This this what you're doing, it's uh uh it it's kind of electrifying for me and it makes me think um that you know this kind uh, well, let me ask you this. Did you do this kind of stuff live ever? Yes. And what uh, was what was the audience like? Did they did they want to dance? Did they want to listen? Were they sophisticated listeners or were they kind of partying? It's a little bit of all of the above. Yeah. Um most of the time when I am on tour, I am playing organ and yeah. I add some electronics, but it's very common for me to be with a guitarist and a drummer or a bassist and a drummer. So I actually have a duo with my wife where we play electronics and she uh, sings in Kosa and lots of other languages. Hmm. Um, and we do folk music from around the world and we were both doing electronics. She hmm. like loops her voice hmm. and I use these electronics. Hmm. So it's, it's great to do it live. The electronics are always, it's a lot to get together. It's a lot to kind of handle. Um, so that can be a little intimidating, but the beauty of these sets that we just watched is it's all set up and it doesn't move. And I kind of know where everything is and I have the sound kind of dialed in and it's, I almost think it's the most, uh, authentic presentation of my music that I've made in a way, because I'm completely in control of every aspect of it, you know, um, I do miss playing with people, but sometimes when you've really got everything tuned in the way you like it, you can really express yourself um, just as you like, I guess. So that's what those are doing for me, for sure. I think that's fabulous, um, and I totally get it. And actually, uh, yesterday I was speaking with Rio Sakaidi, who's the artistic director of uh, the Jazz Gallery. Sure. And what a great conversation. She's really She's got a real great point of view. They have and... a great B3 there. Oh, cool. It's a cool place, yeah. Well, she she was, uh, I guess, apparently all this year or maybe since this summer, uh, like once a week, they've been uh, doing this um, four artist moment, you know, short, uh -huh. actually. I think each artist has 10 minutes. And... Uh -huh. um, so once a week they'll they're producing that and uh chester i wasn't familiar with his name chester i forget anyway she showed me one of one of them and he was mm -hmm. it was really cool the music was great but also what he was doing was he was cooking with his daughter his 14 year old daughter so mm -hmm. he made a video and so he was cooking and then he was then you know kind of morphed over to his playing and mm -hmm. um, he was playing drums definitely and what else was he playing he was playing something else and singing mm -hmm. a little and it, and then he would kind of go back to the cooking it was great it was really a, a personal expression that he was in control of you know uh -huh. and and people are interesting and they do it's interest it's everything is interesting you know yeah 
But that listening to you made makes me want to the the thing that I I love performing live, but it's not super often that I can that I can perform what I really want to, you know. Sure. And um, like I have a group called The Moment that um, mm -hmm. I, I'm I don't know if you know any of these guys, Gary Fukushima on keyboards and um, uh -huh. Gary, I've, I've heard of. He's he's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Manning on tenor, mm -hmm. uh, Brad Dutz on percussion, um, and Jeff Richmond on guitar, and just the combination of people. We could not play to, for a year or two, and then when, as soon as we play again, it's exactly the same experience, and it's it's a bit abstract. And I can, the last time we did it, I actually did poetry, which I had never really done, you know, with a mm -hmm. group and, um, and improvised. And that's, that's something I really love, but I, there's, you really have to go out of your way here, at least to create a gig that that is going to happen. And, and uh -huh. you're probably not going to make a lot of money, you know? Uh -huh. So I don't know if I don't, I, I imagine that New York has more places like that, but maybe that's not true. Well, you know, now there's not a lot of live gigs anywhere. Yeah. I actually play, I get to play a few. I get called to play a lot of gigs. Um, now you mean? Not a lot, but yeah. obviously compared to what it used to be, it's a lot less. But like I got to play uh, at Birdland when they were doing their fundraiser. That was cool. I played at the Iridium. I played at Smalls a few times. Um, there's this great, very open hotel called the Roxy Hotel. Have you ever been there on Sixth no, Avenue? I no. And it's very open and it's very fun to play there. They have a nice stage and I've been playing mm. there, but you know, I don't play a lot of, I don't travel anywhere to play concerts and I used to travel very much, you know. Yeah, we were talking about that before. You had two yeah. tours that got canceled. Two have been canceled, and I have another one in October that's supposed to happen, but it's it's very hard to say what will happen. And where is that supposed to be? Well, I have a lot of concerts in Prague. I've actually written some symphonic brass music for an orchestra called the Modern Art Orchestra in Budapest. Oh. Um, I was supposed to go to Berlin. Um, I'm also supposed to go to Switzerland and Italy and Spain. Wow. But Everything is, you know, hard to say what will happen now. Yeah. How, it's okay. How, it's okay. It's were okay. you supposed to bring a band? I always play, you know, I'm, because I go to those countries a lot, I almost have my bands in those countries that I, and I've played with them for years now. Oh. So it's very uncommon for me when I go to Europe to bring people to Europe. It's really expensive, you know. Yeah. It's not like the old yeah. days. That's yeah, for sure. it used to be used to be easier. <clears throat> yeah, um, well, that's great if if the whole thing kind of loosens up and moves yeah. well, on. Well, we'll see. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be freaked out about going back too soon either. E either like I'm gonna wait until it seems sensible. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I miss being in Prague. I love this city very much. I love Berlin. Um, I actually even lived in Prague like half the time for a little while. Oh. So it's it's hard. This is the longest I'd ever I've ever gone without being there, you know, yeah. since I've been going there, which has been for a long time. Huh. What why uh what were the circumstances that you lived there? Um I had a weakness for the ladies there for a little while, Kathy, I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> um and uh I had, I mean, not many, but I had a few wonderful girlfriends and uh, I had taught there um, at Yezhik Conservatory. They have something called the Czech Jazz Workshop, which is kind of like a master class that they run in the summer. And I did that for many years. That's actually where I met my wife, Melanie. We were both teachers in this workshop. Um, I even write uh, for a magazine in Prague oh, oh. Um, called Musicus. And, you know, it's very centrally located. So I kind of, because I spent so much time there and I've been going there, I was going to Prague before I even lived in New York, which was 1994. Oh. Um, and I just have a lot of friends there. I have a lot of places I can stay. 
it's not very expensive. Um, and it was kind of, it's kind of where my home base is in central Europe when I'm playing in Germany or Switzerland or any of these other places, I usually fly back to Prague. Um, so that's kind of been what I've been doing for like the last five years when I, when I'm in Europe. Uh, where are you from originally? I am from Meriden, Connecticut. Meriden. Is that near, kind of near Hartford or no? It's halfway between Hartford and New Haven. It sounded like one of the smaller, the smaller towns. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. I left, I left soon. I wasn't there for long and I, and I came here. <laughs> I see. Yeah. I, I had some good college years in that area. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I went to college in Boston, but I went to Berkeley actually. And, but I had the, a group of friends, <laughs> you know, we were deadheads and stuff, you know, uh -huh. and, um, one of the guys was, uh, had, was from that area. I can't remember the, the name of the city, but w one summer we went and built a house you know wow. just a group of us college kids basically and it, like yeah it was it was a great summer <laughs> i can never get the angles straight for building it's not well, a, it's not one of my strengths well you, you know none of us were experienced so i just laugh when i think of <laughs> how he conceived of that plan you know <laughs> did you finish the house we didn't finish it, but we, you know, we got some work done and, uh, and then he finished it and somebody bailed him out, you know, cause he was, yeah, it was, he was a kid, you know, he was uh -huh. he didn't have money. He wasn't from a money background or anything like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It was the seventies, man. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's what happened huh. in the seventies. Uh -huh. Um, so, uh, so let's see. I want oh yeah, I wanted to ask you too at the bottom of your resume or your bio, it uh -huh. says you are into uh at a um a fight form. What are you into? You're you're a black belt or I you know, I'm a black sash in white crane kung fu. Well, you say that like that, but to me that's that means something. <laughs> I don't know what White. it means. It means it's kind of impressive. That, let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, I I was I do that very much now, but I don't like uh, fight with anybody anymore. Do anything like that. That was years ago, um, and I did many different kinds of martial arts. But now I do mostly the the old Chinese forms. You know, they're very beautiful to look at. The hand motions are you know. And it's uh, very good for breathing and meditation. That's kind of how I use them now to stay in shape. Do you practice them every day? Yep. How long does it take? I usually do an hour a day. Uh-huh. Morning? Sometimes more. Huh? Mornings? I usually do a little bit in the morning and a little bit in the evening. Because our, it's artistic, too, you know, and you have to remember... It's like learning a piece of music. You have to learn the, the different postures and how they work and how to do them gracefully. So it's, it's very interesting. It's very physical. It's very good for staying in shape. It's lovely. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm assuming you, you've done this for a long time. Why, what made you start? I actually started to do a form of karate called Washin Ru when I was very young. Um, and I did that for a few years and then I did nothing for 10 years, I would say. And I was about 30 and I was a little heavy. I was a little out of shape. Like I wasn't really taking care of myself. And I was looking for some kind of um, exercise that I could do to get myself in shape. Um, and I saw for the first time a Bruce Lee movie, which I had never seen before. And I was like, wow, what is this guy doing? And I became very interested in all of the, you know, my main area of interest is the old animal style. So Kung Fu in the beginning uh, was fighting styles patterned after movements of animals. Um, so they have a tiger style. They have something called Eagle Claw, which is not one of the original five animals, but I do the crane, which is one of the original five animals. Um, 
The Shaolin Temple in China was burned like three times, so it's very hard to get the accurate information about these early styles, but it's a big area of interest in mine. Yeah. So that's what I that's what I was into. <clears throat> um, and, and through doing that, I became aware of, of jujitsu and you know lots of other ones that I became interested in too. It's interesting. So, uh, and obviously it, uh, well, I'll ask it in a different way. In what ways does it benefit your playing? That's the biggest benefit, you know, because I became very aware of my body. And uh, I would say when I was about 30, I had a very painful inner dialogue with music and I almost stopped applying myself to music when I started to study Kung Fu because I had just had it, like working so hard at something. And it was when I released my hold of it so tightly that I could just almost instantly do it in a way that I couldn't before. Mm. Um, and I became very passionate about practicing Kung Fu, which is a very similar thing as practicing the piano. It's obviously more physical. Um, but the mind, the mind muscles you're using are the same, you know, and it makes you very fast. It makes you very aware. Um, and I could almost play piano the way I wanted to overnight when I started to get serious about it. It was really some kind of experience for me. And to this day, when I go to play the piano, I just, my mind goes very blank, you know, and, uh, it doesn't. I never have any kind of negative self-talk when, when I play music, which is not the truth in my regular life, you know. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's kind of very specific in, in uh, music. But I think, I think that's, I think that's a bit common for people to have different points of view in, in their production of music, mm -hmm. you know as as opposed to their regular life mm -hmm. um i mean you can even say that you know how you observe sometimes that there's somebody who's a real a-hole and mm -hmm. but in their music they're gorgeous yeah you know? complicated people are complicated yeah i think that's i surely really, am i love that i think that's really interesting i've had lots of conversations with people you know of course and students always but um <clears throat> on on uh, how do you achieve that non-judgment or open a clear mind uh, while you're playing? Uh, but that's what you just described is really interesting and and uh, important, I think. But you were fortunate, or whatever, however you want to call it, to find that right. I mean, I don't think a I've, lot of people I've find been, that. I've been fortunate in general, extremely yeah. so. Yeah. Did you have a mentor growing up? Um, uh, well, well, my mother, my does. mother, my mother plays the piano very well, and that was the first person I heard play the piano, and she played very well. Um, she's also an incredible mother, <laughs> so uh, I was fortunate with my parents. They were both educators. We had a pretty wonderful upbringing. It was strict, but very fair. And um, and they were just lovely, you know, and uh, I was able to play music. I started to work in music very young, which was a little hard for my parents. I think I was 15 or 16 and I was working a lot, you know. Mm. Um, but just from being, I've played thousands and thousands and thousands of gigs you know, yeah. and uh, it's not uh, it's not so hard to do if you've put that much time into something, you know, uh -huh. and you were trying to pay attention. Um, yeah, it's there's no magic to it, really, to me. You know? <laughs> I mean, there is a magic to it. Music is magical, but it's a lot of little steps repeated and repeated and repeated until it's just very internalized, you know. Yeah. Yep. People say that all, I think almost every person I've spoken to on this 
show has said that basically in various ways. Rio said it yesterday because, you know, people ask her a lot how she did it because she's been doing it for 25 years. And uh -huh. she saw it from through really hard times. You know, it's been, it always is. been a nonprofit. And mm -hmm. uh, she just said, I just kept going. I didn't even really think that it couldn't be done, even in the mm -hmm. worst of times. She's one day she had five dollars in her pocket. She had two toddling, two toddlers. Mm -hmm. Her husband at the time was on the road coming back in three days. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, no, she had twenty dollars in her pocket and five dollars she put in her tank mm -hmm. and fifteen dollars she had to live on and feed feed everybody for three days sure. and she but she just it was like okay yeah <laughs> that's what has to be done you know yeah. and just kept kept going forward you know mm -hmm. um i've been there yeah yeah it's it's really it's a great it's a great thing that the human spirit can just kind of refocus you know mm -hmm. it's like uh you can be lying on the ground practically dead and still have the ability to refocus and get up mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing there's a um there's a um let's see what is his name i forget his name there's a there's a man who um do you know of stephen nakmanovich the author of free play no <clears throat> so stephen nakmanovich is a improvisational violinist and a great author who's wrote a book like kind of like effortless mastery he it was mm -hmm. my bible for years called free play improvisation and life in the arts and oh. it's the kind of book that you open anywhere and it's the sentence you read is speaking to you you know sure and um he also wrote another one the um the art of the art of is the art of now the art of is oh god for some reason probably because that first book was such so momentous to me i always forget forget what mm -hmm. the second book is called sorry stephen but um <clears throat> yeah so oh god the name kind of came and went but he talked to zipper aha zipper mm -hmm. so there's a zipper auditorium in um the music school downtown in la here that's Co coburn music school and Zipper was, uh, he had an incredible history. I won't go into the whole thing, obviously, but he was in two camps, two prisoner camps uh, in different continents. And um, he, in the, in the German camp, <clears throat> he taught his prisoners um, um, a classical piece, and mm -hmm. they made instruments out of, dirt and insects and you know anything mm -hmm. that was around and yeah. they would go in the back in the dead of night and play this piece you know mm -hmm. i mean it was just uh it's that kind of thing you know when you when you i mean we're talking about what we go through and it's it's equally as important but you know it just shows you wow humans can really they they can really pull back and bounce yeah. forward and it's a it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So your mentor, you would say, I guess. Well, parents... after that, I you mentioned Kenny Werner. I actually studied with Kenny Werner before there was a book, Effortless Mastery. Oh, cool. Um, so at that point, when I studied with him, he was doing something called the five finger exercise. I'm sure he talks about that in the book uh -huh. where you just drop your fingers on the piano and trying not to care what they sound like, which is kind of a, you know, that's what he's talking about in general, is to be present and to have no uh, judgment of what's going yes, on. Right. I also studied with a great Boston guru named Charlie Bonacus. Have you ever heard of him? Absolutely. He was big so at, I, at Berkeley. Yeah, I went to Berkeley for a little while. Um, I studied with a great pianist, I bet you know her, Ellen Rowe, who teaches yeah. in Michigan now. So yes. she taught my undergraduate. I actually, her husband at the time was Neil Larrabee. I studied classical music with him. So I studied classical music when I was in college. Um, and that's about it. I had a, I had two organ lessons in my life. I had one with Sam Yehel and one with Larry Golden. You're Goldings, kidding, two? Which were great, yep. How does that but happen, that man? 
Well, after <laughs> after I came here and was working, I was 21, basically. I never really studied with anybody after that. Um, so those people were very big for me. Remember, there was no YouTube or anything like that in those days. So I listened a lot to recordings. And I was lucky living in the Hartford area. I got to be on gigs when I was very young with some jazz guys who were just coming through town. So that was incredible experience. And I learned, I knew a lot of tunes when I was young. And, you know, by the time I came to New York at 21, I had already played a lot of different kinds of music. Hmm. Um, Did you play with Billy Hart in Connecticut? No, but I played with, uh, I played with J-Mo from the Allman Brothers. I played with Houston Person when he would come to town, Lou Donaldson, Charles McPherson. Um, I used to play with the uh, Macatar Murphy from the Blues Brothers. <laughs> and this is when I was like 16 or 17 years old. Huh. So. Uh, and were you playing was, organ at that time? I played no organ. I played keyboards, synths, and piano. Okay. I didn't really start to play a lot of organ until I got to New York. Okay. And then I started to play in Harlem a lot, um, which is, that's Jack McDuff's organ in Showman's too. Hmm. So I learned how to play organ there and I started to, you know, very few people in New York ever even heard me play the piano. Even though that's my training is on the piano, you know, not really organ. Um, but now in jazz music, I mostly, I think most of the people think of me as playing Hammond organ. I think when you when there's a great organ player, you're really it seems like the attention really goes there. You know, same with Carrie Frank. I mean, he sure he is a piano player, but most people think it's of a him strange. It's a very him. exotic and strange instrument, you know, yeah. um, and not a lot of people really do the whole big thing with the pedals. And it's not like when you think about all of the people that play instruments, the Hammond organist list is the shortest. I mean, maybe harp is a little shorter, but, you know, it's not it's not like there's a hundred thousand Hammond organists in New York or anything like that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a rare it's thing. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard a few good ones in uh, L.A. I mean, of course, Larry Goldings is Joe you know, Bag is there. He's Joe great. Bag. Yeah. Carrie. There's a guy who plays um, Larry Goldings. Does he still live in L.A.? He does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Larry Goldings. He's incredible. <clears throat> Yeah, totally incredible. Oh my god. Ty Bailey, do you know Ty? Yeah, Ty Bailey oh. and there's there's a guy on the south end of LA, uh but I I don't remember his name, but he he plays with this guitar player named Jacques Lejour. Oh, I know. I know Jacques very well and I know oh. this gentleman who plays organ too. He's really good. He is good. He lives in the house behind Jacques. Oh. So I know those guys. I know Jacques very well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I want to I you know, um what an incredible dresser, too. Like, he's always looking just amazing. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about Jacques? Yes. Yes, and, and also his new look. Well, I say new, but it's about a year or two years old. You know, he looks kind of like Pharaoh Sanders, you know. He, has... he, looks, he looks great. Yeah. Um, we, know, <laughs> we know his wife, Kim, too. And oh. uh, we usually play when I come out to L.A. So we've become friends over the last 10 years. So, oh, that's yeah, cool. I see that. I see that group plays at uh, Lavender Blue. So I go to Lavender that. Blue. That's it. Yeah. I, that's a place I miss. Yeah, it's That's cool. It's, I miss, I love Los <laughs> Angeles so much. I really do. Um, yeah. Uh, let's, can we hear something else? Sure. I'm gonna do you want to hear something I do with people? Sure. Let's hear there something. There are some good can... ones. If you scroll down there, there's some good trio stuff of me playing Hammond organ with uh, Ari Honig and Galad Hexelman. Those are nice. Oh. That sounds That's good. a very good, very good uh, group. Yep. So keep scrolling down. Keep going oh, down. You played with Oz Noy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm keeping. Uh, There's George uh, Coleman. Keep going down. Oh. oh. Big G. The trio at the Bop Shop. Oh. Do you, uh, I think I can we're go maybe to not your... on my videos. You might have to, yeah. Is there go a way here. you can click on the videos? Yeah. 
So under, if you click on the videos thing, there you go. So you see with uh, me standing there with Galad and uh, Ari Honig, those might be good. Keep going down. Keep going down. Right here? Yeah. Oh. Yeah? Yeah, okay. yeah. That's a All good right. one. <clears throat> So this is me being, you know, Pam and Dorgan. Okay. <laughs> I'm much thinner now than in this video, wow. <laughs> this is like a dream trio. Sounds great.
love that. Wow. Tell me, tell us a little bit about the musicians. Well, <clears throat> Ari Honig is one of my favorite drummers. We've known each other for, for quite a few years. I think we moved to New York around the same time. He actually played on the first album I ever recorded. And that was 21 years ago. Um, he's very much known for coming in and out of uh, different time signatures. He's got masterful polyrhythmic uh, technique. Um, very interesting, very nice man. Uh, very friendly all the time. Great person to have on a gig. Gilad, um, I've known for maybe 15 years. Um, Israeli guitarist, considered one of the top people for sure. Um, incredible, sensitive, comping great lyrical um, lines. You know, I love everybody. All of my friends from Israel um, are amazing at playing jazz, I have to say. Um, Itai, Chris is in my sextet. He's a flautist from Israel. I've never heard it, the flute being played like that before. Mm. And um, there's something very special to me about jazz musicians from Israel, um, the way they sound. It's it's really great. And I think Gilad has that. Um, you know, Tom Silberstein is another great um, guitarist from Israel. It's, it's, they have all of the uh, schooling with this very lyrical, soulful approach. I, I really love it. You know, I love the way it sounds. And for organ trio music like this, you know, someone like Gilad is a perfect, perfect guitarist for that. It can really go anywhere, you know, has great pedals to great sounds can make a lot of different things happen. So those two guys together, I mean, that's, you know, you can't, in my opinion, I can't do much better for a trio than those two guys. This is, uh, it's really beautiful music. It's kind of on the sense, more sensitive side than I would sure. expect from an, from an organ trio. Right. And, you know, I play that kind of organ too, but I mostly do that for other people. My music is not super traditional organ trio music, I would say. You can obviously see with the electronics, that's, you know, yeah. really not traditional. So Was, was that, that a song you composed? It, it was, yeah. It's what called it? Time Changes. Time Changes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your compositions. You, I'm uh -huh. sure you've composed a lot, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do, do I'm just curious about this. Do other people play your compositions or is it mostly? Good? Yes. It was a great story. I was on a gig uh, with a great drummer, Victor Lewis, you know, yeah. and we played together when I was first in New York. I saw him many years later. I said, Victor, I don't know if you remember me. I used to play with you at a club called Detour on 13th Street. And he goes, remember you, I teach my students your music. And uh, he taught this, he taught this song to wow. class. Wow, that's really so, nice. Uh, people, people, you know, I recorded quite a bit for Positone. Other artists have recorded my music for them. I write a lot for European ensembles. Like I wrote a program of uh, big band music for the Jazz Doc Orchestra in Prague. I have all this brass music that I'm going to do in Budapest, hopefully next time I go. So I, this is actually the slowest time of writing um, I've ever had, because I usually am writing all the time for whatever thing I have to do. I'm usually writing for something, either a recording session, I'm uh, scoring some music for someone or, uh, yeah. Do you, uh, in a kind of a typical time that that would be, is your time, uh, is your time, do you have off times or do you, are you like always working? Like, I work a lot. I work, a lot. I work yeah. every day. I don't work day and night, but uh, I get up in the morning and I work. Yeah. And I have a, I have a pretty strict schedule. You know, I get up, I work for a couple hours and I exercise maybe a little bit. I'll have lunch. And then I'll go back to work. And usually at five or six, I stop and I work on creative things. Either, either if I'm writing about something or I'm writing music or practicing. Yeah. You kind of sound like a Libra. 
You're very <laughs> balanced. I, not that I know what I'm talking about, I'm but a, I'm a Sagittarius. Oh, Sagittarius. Okay. Well, in my in my experiences, Sagittarius are very friendly and uh -huh. uh, open armed. <laughs> I'd have to say I'm this way. <laughs> um, I'm curious, and I. It, what's cool about these conversations is that I get to ask questions that uh, seem obvious and apparent, but I just, I actually don't know about. So I am curious about use of different appendages at once. And, uh -huh. um, you know, of course, I've known people, you know, I, and I've talked to people about this, drummers especially, and uh I had a friend here who was a blind piano player, Dave Mackay, who just, I, he had this, such um, individual kind of personalities for his hands, you know? Mm -hmm. It was like a band playing together. It was really uh -huh. interesting. But obviously for the, um, and I've talked to Carrie about this too, but for the organ, it just seems like there's, there's, um, a lot to think about and get comfortable with and coordinate. I'm sure now it's very easy, but um, what was it like actually learning it? And, and is there a hard part still for you to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like falling out of bed now, right? You know, when I was a kid too, I played well-tempered clavier, you know, oh. all day long. And to me, if you are a keyboardist, and you play that music, There's you need nothing else, you know? Mm. Um, so if you're, I always played with both hands. I always remember playing bass lines. I always remember, I was actually playing bass on gigs when I was a kid, even before I played keyboards on gigs. Mm. So I've always thought about the bass. I've always thought about my left hand. Um, to me, they kind of go together. Um, the hardest part for me about playing music, it's not, I don't think keyboard instruments are technically hard to play. If you're playing some Franz Liszt, you know, transcendental etudes, it's hard. But if you want to be a jazz player, I don't feel like it's as technically demanding as, say, playing the trumpet. So the hard part for me was getting my mind into a space where it was easy for me to improvise and have ideas without getting jammed up and without some kind of negative self-talk or something like that, you know. Also, was it hard, is it hard to, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's not too hard, but was it hard at some point to not play bass when you had a bass player with you? I have a hard time playing organ where there is a bass player. That's not as comfortable as me. And the pedals on the organ, that's very physical because you're basically going like this with your leg all night and if people like to play very fast tempos it's like you're you're basically going like this with your leg all night so it's very physical too yeah you know? do, you, do you take your shoe off no <laughs> i play with wingtips <laughs> just curious carrie plays without shoes so i was uh -huh. and i have seen like what who's that the barefoot contessa or right a lot North. of a lot of guys take their shoes off a lot of guys have special shoes i just play with my shoes you know yeah. Plus, you know, the white crane, you you practicing standing on one leg all the time. And in my serious years, I was doing it on bricks where I would stand on one leg for a long time. It makes your core strength and your balance more than people that don't do that and must, you know. And I'm sure that had something to do with my physical approach um, to the organ, you know. Yeah. Um. Also, I'd like to ask about your teaching. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so tell me, uh, you you uh, do you teach? Sorry, get it's okay. My fan. <laughs> um, do you teach in a uh, university, or uh, do you teach privately mostly? I do everything. I'm like uh, people at the new school can study with me if they finish their first year, I believe. Um, so I don't know if I'm a, considered a higher elective or what that would be. Yeah. I also teach at the 92nd Street Y, um, and I teach privately, and I give master classes. You know, I have a lot of books and videos about uh, organ and uh, and stuff like that too. Oh, so I, I noticed. Don't you have a uh, don't you have a kind of a 
ongoing class online or I don't really have an ongoing class online, but I make a couple videos for my music masterclass. So you might know Adam Small. He's in LA or was. Um, uh, I have like four videos out for them. Um, I have a book on Hal Leonard publishers about the Hammond called 101 Hammond B3 Tips. Hmm. Um, and I wrote instructional articles for many magazines for years, keyboard magazine, electronic musician, um, I write, um, I've written educational articles for Downbeat and Jazz Times. And I write for a few uh, European magazines too. So it's something I've kind of always done. <laughs> when, I was, when I was writing my column for Keyboard Magazine, that's when I first started to do um, a lot of it. And, you know, the master classes and the students kind of evolved through me having these materials, I think, you know. Cool. So it happened pretty organically, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Tony Jones is here. He's a drummer and singer. Hi, Tony. And, and uh, he he asks if you're use, you use your left hand when tempos are fast. If I use my left hand when tempos are fast, you mean on the organ? Yeah. Yes. I you know most Hammond organists don't walk everything with their feet the bass line is almost always in the left hand and mm. the left foot is kind of bumping on one pedal to get the percussive and sometimes they'll walk or turn around some people do a little more some people do a little less it's a little bit uncommon for organists to play the bass all with their feet which was a style that happened very much before jimmy smith that's what everybody was doing mm. after jimmy smith people kind of started to do it this modern way where they would have percussion on the organ they would play the bass line with their left hand and accent it with the feet. But, you know, if you don't do any of the pedals on the feet, it sounds a lot different. Like it puts a lot of point on the sound. Organ bass can be can be washy. Plus, I do a trick for up tempos. You know, most people play with a flat foot, but at a fast tempo, there's some wood in front of the pedals on the organ. I'll rest my toe on the wood and I'll tap with my heel, which is mm -hmm. less work somehow. So that's I've kind of worked out a little hack where I do that. You know? That's kind of like chopping with a knife, right? Yeah, yeah, Same exactly. Same way, like you exactly. Would... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, Greg Karuka says hello. Hello. Um, <laughs> so um, okay, that's cool. Um, 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 I feel like I want to hear something else. Can we? Okay. You should hear me play with Melanie, my wife. Okay, let's hear there, There's some of that electronic stuff there. If you go to my videos, she, I call her the talented charrette. <laughs> Actually, um, Brad Dudes, the percussionist that I play with, he's, he's one of the best percussionists in town. Very mm -hmm. eclectic. And uh, although he did move recently, but uh, he's still, I, I consider him an LA person. Does he play with Bevan Manson a lot? Yes. Okay, so I met him on one of Bevan's recording sessions. Yes, he's excellent. Yeah, very kind of a quirky guy. And No, yeah. he was, that was a great, you know, Bevan Manson is one of my favorite uh, pianists too. I think he's incredible. Isn't he? He's um, a genius. He's great. He came to my college. He went to Eastman School of Music with Ellen yeah. Rowe, who was my yeah. professor, uh -huh. and came to my college. He had an album out, and a young Matt Wilson was on drugs. Um, and the album was called Rhythm Chowder. And it was it, the, the album had a really profound impact on my, uh, the way I thought about trio because they were doing, Matt Wilson was getting lots of wild sounds on the drums. Bevan was getting unusual sounds on the piano. So for me to come to LA and to play on one of, and it was for, some of it was for his album and some might've been underscoring for a movie. I'm not sure, but it was, it was like a dream come true for me to play on something at Bevan's, you know. That's cool. I love yeah. Bevan. He's I've known him since. Um, well, actually, I, I don't think I knew him in Boston when I went back to Boston to perform. Um, and I wanted to I performed at Scullers and I had sure. to get a band and my girlfriend turned me on to Bevan. And the first time I went over to get together with him, he introduced me to the song he wrote that was 
it was like he wrote it for me. It was the intervals were stuff that I was drawn to. And it was in my key, which is very, very different, you know, for uh -huh. somebody to show me a song that's in my key. And um, anyway, that was my introduction to him. That was a long time ago. And then he's, he's, uh, he was uh, co-produced um, this uh, small chamber orchestra record that I had, and he arranged five of the songs. Just he's brilliant. He'd be listening, yeah. he'd be listening back to something in the studio, working on a totally different arrangement. And he he'd be working, and he'd say, "Bar fifty five, right there. There was a note there. It's like, wow. It was, it, he's a really and he's a lovely person. Really yeah. cool person too. So yeah. smart. Great to talk yes. to. Good educator. Uh -huh. But but Brad Dutz, his wife." Uh, is an artist. She's really a beautiful artist. As a matter of fact, uh, I used her artwork on this last one of the last records that I had with Larry Koontz and Josh Nelson. Wow, that is very nice. Yeah, and actually, this goes above or below that. I, I can't. Remember. I think it goes below. This page uh -huh. goes really below that. But um, and. She is a loop artist. I mean, I always thought she was playing keyboard until I got real close one time and realized she was actually, she had just set up the loops, uh -huh. you know, on a platform that looked keyboardish. Mm -hmm. And she was, she's Japanese and she was improvising, singing in Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, she's really talented, really talented. So I'm eager to hear your wife as well. So here I am. Okay, yeah. so if you go down quite a bit, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ooh, a little bit up from there. There she is. You can see her. She's the good looking one. Right here? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is like our electronic duo that we would do. Okay. I mean, get, I'm going to have to pay for a professional YouTube soon. Oh 
soy María de Buenos Aires Soy la más bruja cantando y amando también Si el bandoneón me provoca tierra tata la muerda fuerte en la boca tierra tata con Dios espasmos en flor que yo tengo mi ser about fortunate <laughs> uh, yeah man <laughs> it's good if you can play the piano a little bit <laughs> but it's better if you have a cool wife yeah. <laughs> um tony i think that might be your um your computer because uh the, over here it does not look stuttered at all um, but who knows? Who really knows about tech? I don't, I don't ask me. The last few weeks have been so strange for me for tech. Things keep going awry, and I have to keep figuring out how to deal without my computer, which, which died a few weeks ago. Why did it die, Brian? Nothing lasts <laughs> forever, it would appear. <laughs> it, it probably died to uh, test me, you know? Damn it. Mm -hmm. Test me, man. I hate I hate that when that happens. <laughs> Sorry, I I'm uh, I'm inundated, of course. Um Yeah, uh uh if there was if there was a record or two that you listened to uh until you had to replace it coming up, what 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 would those be? Um Rubber Soul by the Beatles. For those who are about to rock, we salute you by ACDC. <laughs> Diver Down by Van Halen. Goldberg Variations 1956 recording. Memorable Tabula Duet 1986, Usted a la Raka and Zakir Hussein. And the first Jaco Pistorius solo yeah. album. Yeah. That's a smattering of styles. <laughs> <laughs> Jaco, the Jaco thing, yeah. 
It's funny because for year, many years I listened and I recognized the music, but I didn't know names. So it took me a long time into, into adulthood to actually kind of become cognizant of who it was playing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. But yeah, the, um, the Jocko stuff, that was, that was definitely part of it. S Schofield for me was sure. like that too, you know. I knew a lot of Schofield tunes. And I knew it was Schofield, but I didn't actually. Did you play in his it. ensemble at Berkeley? He had uh, Rick Peckham taught his ensemble there. The Schofield ensemble. It was pretty cool. No, I did not. You know, I think I went to school with at the same time as he did. It was, uh, I went in 72 to 75. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> I played flute, which I keep trying to practice again. But me too. Know. Oh, wow. Ooh. Oh, I want to learn that. Yeah. Something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was just luck that I happened to be in that key, the same key. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> wow. I played flute with Brian yeah. Charette. Yeah, I feel kind of impressed. You know what I was thinking yesterday? I was watching something and I thought, damn, you know, you know what I miss that I would love to do, which I don't think there's any way to do this because I'm not that great a flute player, but mm -hmm. I would like to play in an orchestra again, you know, even like mm -hmm. a, whatever, a community orchestra. But I love I love to play the flute. You know, the hard part for the flute is playing in tune and having the stamina, you know. But I write all my music on the computer with a flute, not with a keyboard instrument. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So I hear the, the inner voicings. I don't necessarily, I can think of the chord shape on the piano, but the melodies, most of it are these melodies that I come up with on the flute. That's interesting. Um, I was listening last night to a small a small uh, i don't know what you call it. it's not certainly not a big band let's see there's piano guitar vibes bass drums um sax player who doubles actually <laughs> strangely enough he's he used to be a piano player and he doubles on hammond <laughs> uh -huh. and baritone and alto and flute mm -hmm. and tenor and then trombone trumpet flugelhorn wow. um and i mean he's not that that's the other people in the band mm -hmm. and then a guy on uh, tenor and alto um mm -hmm. so and i was listening and you know when i went to berkeley i actually went for arranging and comp and i really many times over the years i've kind of thought with a longing you know, I'd like to study again, but I don't have faith that I can stick to it um, because I have all these different things that intrigue me that I work on. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it takes it takes some concentrated effort, but sure. I really love to hear those inner harmonies. And it would be a real turn on for me to actually do that. Um, I don't know, maybe when I'm too old to do other things, but I don't know when that'll be. <laughs> You know what I mean, Brian? It's just you, my you still got a way. You got a ways to go. Yeah, a little bit. Um, let's see. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, several rock things, and do you does that come out in your music? And um, sure, do you do you uh, like reharmonize? Do you ever get into that, like picking rock tunes or pop tunes and reharmonizing and working? I don't those? do that a lot. I write my own music mm -hmm. with that kind of sensibility sometimes. Mm -hmm. I play guitar, too. Oh. So on some of my early albums, I play a lot of guitar oh. more than keyboards. I don't do that as much as I used to, but I'm kind of a rocker, I think. You know, when I was... First getting into music, I was into rock band. I was into progressive rock bands, especially. Yes, mm. Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Yeah. And I loved Iron Maiden. I loved Van Halen. I loved all this kind of guitar stuff. You know, I was into the hammering on kind of stuff. So 
I think that definitely very much influences my jazz music. But I've been into every kind of music that I know about, too. Like, I investigated jazz music. I investigated classical music. Rock, you know, everything that I've... I mean, I'm sure there are things that I don't know, obviously, but everything that I have come across, especially if I was doing it professionally, I investigated, you know. So I, I think all of those things are informing my music, for sure. Have you uh, played with, like, backed up um, rock people? Yeah. Um, I played with, well, I mean, I don't know if you would call them rock, but I played with Joni Mitchell and Shaka Khan. Oh. Um, I played in Blood, Sweat, and Tears briefly. Oh. Um, I play with J-Mo from the Allman Brothers now, even though we're on hi hiatus now. Um, so, yeah, I've done a lot of that. I've played guitar in groups, huh. not as much anymore, but I, I used to play guitar and keyboard in a group called Mudville in New York, which I really loved. Um, but yeah, yeah. Oz, I play with Oz now. I would say that's jazz music, but it's very rock yes. oriented, you know. So I work a lot with Oz. Yeah. Um, I guess that's the rockingest stuff I do um, right now for someone else. Mm -hmm. um yeah but i've i've uh i've worked in every genre of music a lot i guess you know not just jazz music yeah the uh guitar player i mentioned who was in my kind of a um abstract group jeff richman is a good friend of oz noise mm -hmm. and um they do stuff together he I also guess, from israel and has the same kind of thing on the guitar incredible mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah interesting yeah um so, and the bands that you, um, the bands that you put together, I, obviously that trio is, like you said, the dream trio. Mm -hmm. um, so are, do you have, do you have different solid groups like that? Or do you find that m mostly that you just mix and match? It's a little bit of mixing and match because people are, it's hard to get the same people. I mean, yeah. uh, but I have people that I work with a lot. Um, I almost think when I go to Europe, I have more steady members in my band. Uh, you know, <laughs> right, if you play with right. a band in LA, the third sub will bag the gig right before, <laughs> you know. So my my sub list is very deep for LA. Um, uh, <laughs> but you know, you, being in the scene of all these different places, you become friends with people and, and it's, uh, I find that it's very nice community in all these different places, you know, yeah. like I don't have any beef with anybody or uh, everybody to me for the most part gets along and it's much better than it used to be years ago. I feel like it was much more cutthroat and I feel like it's much more polite now in a way. I know it is in New York. Yeah. Cause when I first moved to New York, it was very lawless years, you know, and it was rough. Yeah. Huh. Um, so why do you think that happened? I mean, why do you think it changed? I think there was more corruption. I think when Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani became mayor, it doubled the police force, basically, and there was a much more police presence. I remember when I was a kid first living here, it was tons of people selling drugs on the street. After Giuliani, that all went away because they really wanted to stop that, you know. Um, and it's much safer than it used to be, I think, you know, in Manhattan, for sure which is where I am most of the time. Um, were you yeah. were you talking about just the general public or were you talking about music too? People being- Music as well. Like you yeah. would go to jam sessions, there would be fights, there would be, oh. it, people would kind of vibe each other. And I guess I don't go to jam sessions like I used to, but I get the sense, you know, the young people in jazz are not like strung out. They're like super sharp, you know, they're like, really professional and acting very, in my opinion, very well and very respectfully. Um, I would say more so than my generation, you know, yeah. who I knew a lot of friends, you know, when I first came to New York in the early nineties, heroin was a really bad problem. Like I had a lot of friends who, who had problems with heroin. Um, 
I don't know if that happens to the degree it does anymore, you know, yeah. but I, you know, I'm older too. I'm like, maybe not totally in touch with what's happening at that level, but, uh, it used to, it, it used to be rougher, I think, than it is now, you know, but by the same token, there also used to be tons and tons and tons of work. You know, I had tons of work when I was a kid. I was even on a soap opera for a while. Um, <laughs> I would go play with just visiting acts uh, to New York, um, things that I never imagined that I, I would do, you know, yeah. uh, just by living here and being in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think, um, where do you think music, the jazz music especially is headed? I think the music is incredible. I don't think anything bad is going to happen to jazz music. Like it'll, there will always be people. I almost feel like music is almost becoming like a found knowledge. It's almost something like everybody can do it a little bit now. And I think you are going to see in the next hundred years, this whole idea of celebrity become much less. What that means, like having a movie star like a Marilyn Monroe or something like that. I think that's going to be much less and you're going to see talented people who grow their audience or grow their business around these virtual things, YouTube, Spotify, whatever. And everybody's going to, more people are going to be able to have a seat at the table as an artist. And there's going to be less of this, um, this is the famous artist who does this, or this is the famous artist who does that. I think that's going to diminish a little bit. I think it's going to be more more world, uh, world. World music influenced, you mean? Yeah, but I, yeah. I, I mean, what I see is, yes, world music influenced and but the less boundaries, you know, right. I think there's going to be much more. And there's already, of course, tons of morphing that's been going on, mm -hmm. I'd say for the last 15 years, I think, at least, mm -hmm. you know, and but I see it. I see it getting faster and faster, you know, I mean, moving into it, fa like even just like what you played in the beginning, your electronic music that you do online now. Uh, I mean, that's and and even though that was from an earlier period as well, now it seems to be more reaching into other communities, I think, you know, mm -hmm. where somebody who might think that they don't like jazz is you know going to mm -hmm. like that you know mm -hmm. um so i th i see it heading more and more towards towards that uh you know yeah and even myself i mean i i think um like on that record i showed you with uh larry Koontz and josh nelson so they're both great amazing jazz players piano and guitar and i uh i think i did let's see one, two. So I did two originals on this. I try and do at least one or two originals on every record. But mm -hmm. I did two originals that were from a, um, a moment in my life when it was what I consider kind of folky, mm -hmm. you know? And they just made, them, made those songs sound incredible. And they weren't exactly, to me, jazz, you know? And I'm even working on um, a song that I wrote now with um, this project that I'm fixing the vocals on to get out. And uh, great players, um, Anthony Wilson and Josh Nelson, Edwin Livingston and uh, Lorca Hart. So, okay, brilliant jazz musicians, but also they, they step into other boundaries, especially mm -hmm. like Anthony has really gotten into a singer songwriter mm -hmm. mode. And um, th this song of mine is, I'd say it's kind of, I don't know what to call it. It's, it's definitely has my history in there, you know? And so mm -hmm. maybe a little on the pop side and it's really, it came out and Anthony did this really beautiful kind of acoustic sound. And um, I was listening to it and- He's great. To... I've been trying to work with him for years, but it just, I haven't been able to catch him, but you know, He's, he's incredible. He's got he's got yeah. everything. He's got the groove. He's got this this like the uh, higher, 
beautiful uh, quality. He's got this mm -hmm. kind of a something that is in the middle and attaches everything. He's really a great musician. I dig the way jazz musicians play in LA a lot. Cool. I really like it. And I, I think it's super interesting for me to play my music in different places in the world to see what each it sounds different, you know, uh, everywhere. And uh, yeah. I love so sad about uh, the blue whale is the blue whale not open anymore. That was an incredible place. Um, that was a great room. Yeah. I was there. I was there last. So Nam last year, I went to go see Larry Goldings with his trio there. It was epic, you know, um, so at least at least I have that great memory, you know, and all of the other great memories there. But that's that'll be very sorely missed that place. We've yeah. lost we've lost some places too. You know? I know. Yeah. It's been outrageous in New York. Yeah. Well, the rents are so high for those places, you know, it's incredible. And they haven't yeah. had income for I mean, who can pay that rent? I mean, some people can and some people just just can't, you know. What I get curious about is so you're a landlord and I understand you need money, you know, and, and I'm sure I don't know the, the, what is actually behind all of it, uh, business wise. And there must be, there must be a lot of stuff, but you have, you have a club, you know, a built club that has been there for years. And so during this time, it's pretty obvious that nobody's making money in that club and mm -hmm. why bother kicking them out why not because who else is going to come in and take it over some Is people are cool some people work out deals and you know there's every kind of person too like some landlords are super cool like my landlord i'm friends with him before i even lived here um and uh but some are just into the money you know or they're you well, know that's there's what every i mean those yeah. people who are into the money who are whatever what who are they going to get to go in there during now nobody yeah i don't you know i don't know what they're thinking about i think people really fixated on money really fixate on all aspects of it and if it was coming in and now it's not that's enough to make them feel destabilized you know um yeah you know money i've never i don't want to say i've never cared about money but to be involved in some kind of fight, you know, if I really cared about money, I wouldn't play music for a living. I would be some kind of multi-million dollar making yeah. whatever, you know. So for people like us, I think it's very hard to understand. But for business people, the way we do it is very hard for them to understand, too, you know. So, yeah. Luckily, Smalls is, is, is open now again, which is an incredible haven for us here. And uh, Mesro is open. And a lot of cool places are still open. 55 Bar, I'm not sure what will happen. Jazz Standard, unfortunately, is no more. Um, so it's everyone is feeling this time right now in the arts. You know, it's really tough. I'm really lucky that I can do these other things. If I only played gigs, I don't know uh, what I would do now, you know. So Speaking I really of, feel for the people suffering with that. Yeah. Speaking of the 55, um, the last, well, I when I saw you in New York, um, you played with me, of course, for the APAP, but also mm -hmm. that was the same period of time when I, when you played the 55 with Vic Juris. Uh-huh. And I was, that was the first time I'd heard Vic Juris and I was, mm -hmm. I'm a big guitar fan long 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 time you know mm -hmm. and so i was totally blown away and i think it was uh i think it was dave liebman who had a musical relationship with vic they Harris. worked together for years yeah yeah so when i had dave on a few weeks ago we talked about vic juris um mm -hmm. an amazing an amazing amazing guitarist musician. yeah he was a he was he was a very cool guy too we were very close i played on a bunch of his records and I would play on his Sunday night gig at the 55 bar a lot. And he played on some of my recordings. So we were very close. It was a huge loss for me. Yeah. 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 Such a nice guy. Yeah. His, his wife. I met his wife that year. She's also a great singer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 
Victorious. Um, if you were, when you teach, are there, uh, what are some of the, what are some of the more significant points that you find yourself telling the students, you know, over and over again? Almost everything is accepting the fact that it takes a long time to learn to play music and going very slowly bar by bar and breaking everything down until its smallest components. I find myself doing that with almost all of my students, you know, because I think it's very common for a student to try to barrel through a piece of music and never really learn each bar. So I try to go bar by bar and I try to perfect one bar of music, kind of get it into the muscle memory. Um, I, a lot of times, and this is true of myself too, a lot of times we have things that are holding us back that have nothing to do with music itself. It's some kind of core wound or some kind of negative self-talk. And so that's half of it is that. And the other half is this very methodical um, going bar by bar, trying to learn all of the concepts, trying to learn the scales and all the different keys, really work on a piece, learn how to finish a piece of music. Um, pretty nuts and bolts stuff. I don't really teach, I'm not teaching anything complicated, I would say, mm -hmm. you know. And I think the principles of music can be learned very quickly. Like I teach people how the system of music works in an hour, basically. And then they have to spend quite a bit of time getting that so they can play a piece of music or understand music, you know. When you say the system, uh, what are you speaking of? Harmony, explaining how the sharps and flats work, explaining how the scales work. Um, it's not a ton of information. Um, there's it's only 12, huh? right. There's 12, there's 12 notes too. It could be like 250 notes. So to me, music is a pretty closed system and I try to approach it that way, you know, when I'm teaching piano. Cool. I lo I like your thinking. <laughs> I, I, I also like to break down to it's, it's simple, but it's it's not it's not simple to do the work. You have to do the work. Yeah. Um, but it is it does break down to simple basics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I how important do you uh, how important do you think learning blues or the blues scale or is? I think it's important. I mean, I surely, you know, you could even say even before that the one the four and the five chord harmonically in western music are the most important uh linchpins in our whole harmonic system you know if you look at baroque music blues music these are the big chords you know to me the system doesn't change the way the way the inflections that are used are different but the system of harmony to me is the same through all periods of music unless it's mm in a different uh, tuning system than well temperament. Um, I'm a little bit into that too, but I, I, you know, I'd spent a little time dabbling in symmetrical harmonic systems of like Olivier Messiaen, but I mostly just stick to the well tempered scale now. And I find myself playing more simply as time goes on, you know, not, not more complicated. I hear I hear stuff like that a lot actually. I yeah. love that. Yeah. It's um see it's like a maturing of being a you know. Well, now I play what I hear in my head only, you know. And if I don't hear anything, I don't do anything, you know. That's yeah. chick's words too. Mhm. Mm yeah. Um Mark Ferber says hi. Hey. <laughs> I was he plays on some of my records. I was pleased to know that Mark moved here in November. And of course, uh -huh. he's, you know, still goes back to New York. And uh -huh. he might be there actually right now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I saw him play. Uh, there's the Sunday gig that I that started up again. And uh, it's uh, Brad Rebuchin on guitar. And um, 
Ahmet Turkmenoglu on bass. Do you know Ahmet? Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful bass player. He got his doctorate, and he but he plays. He's he's kind of an unusual player. You know, he plays. He's just good. He's really good. His rhythm, his rhythms are really good. His soloing, uh, and he plays with really great players. He plays with Aunt Mara Ruiz a lot. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, and then the drummer has been Chris Wabich. And I saw Mark with the group uh, like two weeks ago. And it was wonderful, wonderful to hear Mark and see him again. He plays on one of my favorite albums of mine. I believe it's called Square One. Uh -huh. Is that the is that the album of mine you play on, Mark? I think so. It's either okay. that one. Yeah, I think it's that one. But uh, incredible drummer. Yeah, really beautiful. I had he and his brother on a few weeks ago. I asked him about how he pl physically plays because he's so beautiful to watch too. Uh -huh. Yeah, he is. <laughs> and he did actually say that that was just part of his little do you oh, know their, he said that is the record their grandmother is the blonde <laughs> in that film noir dead on arrival do you know that very famous movie you know they might have told me that but i'm not sure yeah i hope i'm saying that right mark um but that's i'm a big fan of that movie so that was amazing little trivia about uh, the ferbers yeah they're very interesting Mm -hmm. And the fact that they played with each other. His brother's a great, incredible, do. his brother's a great writer. Did he get nominated for a Grammy for that uh, group? Maybe. I'm, I'm not, not sure. sure. But this incredible, his writing is amazing, you know. First time I saw Alan was at a IAJE. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, I think it was a jam session or possibly. And I just remember thinking, this is not your daddy's trombone. <laughs> 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 that was the first time I think <coughs> I had heard trombone played uh -huh. like that, you know, in such a modern, um, uh -huh. adventurous, you know, direction. Yeah. There's a lot of cool trombonists now. It's, yeah, it doesn't have... You know, I feel like the trombone had the stigma of not getting a lot of attention over a trumpet or, or but, you know, now with these uh, incredible guys, you know, they're holding their own against all the soloists, you know, at any tempo, you know, uh, the technical proficiency is just so high, you know. Yeah. And everybody's working so hard. The competition is incredible. So everybody's working so hard to just uh, be a contender, you know. That's so true. That's with singers yeah. too sure you know the young singers coming up their abilities uh are scary you know yeah. they're just incredible and they're they obviously have a inclination toward it and also the wealth of information that's available now that we yeah. just didn't have you know and you could kind of and you know the stakes were not so high you know there were less people who played music and it was uh, i don't want to say more of a cottage industry but now with all of the virtual things if you are an artist you have to be savvy in a lot of different areas that you never had to be before you know so that that makes it to me harder or you have to be able to do m many things you know make a press release um <laughs> you know stuff like that i'm not sure that that happened too much you know 40 or 50 years ago that's so true i, re I mean yeah. i remember always being impressed with charlie hayden because the stories were that every anywhere he went, anywhere he traveled, one of the first things he would do was to get on the phone and call mm -hmm. call people in the area. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't, I agree with you. I mean, uh, actually, um, Suzanne Pitson teaches at City College in New York, and she's mm -hmm. actually uh, responsible for changing the curriculum right now. They're they're actually adding things like business you know yeah. um social media and you mm -hmm. know what are you going to do when you get out you know mm -hmm. um how and, and everybody should have a little bit of that it's mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's intriguing to me to to find musicians you know that i would book or 
<clears throat> you know, in the old days when I was booking clubs, um, that and no, no website, mm -hmm. not even a Wix, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's. I, I mean, what can you say about it? That that's always mm -hmm. been the case. So you know, it's either in your wheelhouse or not. But I mm -hmm. think it should be. I think it really should be in your wheelhouse a little bit, right? Yeah. Well, it's mostly what I do is that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And it it works, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> is there are there people uh, you can tell me or not who they are? But are there people you you haven't played with that you want to, that you'd like to play with? I'd love to play with Schofield or Pat Metheny. I've never played with them before. That would be great. Um, I've gotten a chance to play with a lot of pretty cool people, very luckily. Um, who else would I want to play with? Anybody dead? <laughs> sure. You know, like Charlie Parker or somebody like that? I would love to play with Charlie Parker. You know, I live very close to his house in the East Village. Oh. Um, so big hero of mine. Um, I would love to play with Hank Mobley. Mm. I would have loved to seen Bud Powell play piano. Um, I would have loved to play with Frank Zappa. <laughs> like, I feel like I could have, that is the kind of gig that I feel like I could really sink my teeth into with the electronics and with the, you know, uh, keyboard instruments that I play. Um, yeah, but I've, you know, a lot of what I've wanted to do has happened. So I just want to keep on developing and I want to keep developing my own music, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to just be able to do it again without all of the restrictions. You know, that's going to feel pretty incredible. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, I'm curious, besides, of course, me and your wife, are there singers, <laughs> are there singers that you really appreciate? Sure. I love uh, Cyril Amis. Is that how you say her name? Her Surreal. scatting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Her scatting is incredible. Um, I really love a woman that sings with a rock band called Hiatus Coyote. Do you know them? Her name is Nay Palm. Maybe. Oh, after I, I really that. like her voice. Um, I love, of course, all the Sarah Vaughn, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, I worked for a little while with Keeley Smith. That was oh, amazing. Really? Huh. Yeah, we got to play together for a month at Feinstein's years ago. Huh. Um, she was an amazing singer. Incredible story. One night, Tony Bennett came to hear us at the club. And in the set, Keeley Smith would walk around with the microphone <laughs> at the end of the set. And she would sing When the Saints Go Marching In. And she would hold the microphone up to whoever she was with and have them sing a verse it was kind of a little bit she did so she came to tony bennett to <laughs> sing a chorus of when the saints go marching in and without missing a beat tony bennett goes right into the microphone come on keely you know i don't sing religious songs in nightclubs <laughs> isn't that the wittiest thing you ever heard um yeah <laughs> But uh, I got to play with Shaka. I got to play with Joni. Um, Shaka Khan was pretty amazing to stand next to uh, when she opened her mouth and that voice came out. Wow. You know, um, yeah. So I work with Cindy Lauper in Carnegie Hall. That was pretty oh. fancy. Oh, that must have been fun. Um, I remember going to rehearse with her. You know, in Carnegie Hall, you walk all the way up to the top dressing room, you knock on the door. The door opens and Cindy Lauper has like this pink robe with like a fuzzy collar. Come on in, doll. And this very big Queens. You know. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing. I played with Laura Branigan. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure I may play with Michael McDonald and Phoebe Snow. Oh. Um, so I've gotten, I've been very lucky to work with some super cool singers, you know. Yeah. I really love the rock band Radiohead. I always wanted to play in that band. Hmm. Um, I like this band Hiatus Coyote very much, you know. 
I'm but I, the, the music, I, I have fun every time I play music, you know, it's just about doing it for me. I, I like it. Yeah. I don't really care about the other circumstances. Just to do it is, is enough for me, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to hear a little bit more of, oh, and tell us, tell the audience, um, is your, your uh, present uh, online presence, is that, is that a, um, <clears throat> Is that a con a constant thing, or it's every now and then? Tuesday, I stream. You mean the streaming concert? The streaming, the yeah, yeah. That happens every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time, and you have to be my friend on Facebook. But just you know, if you want to watch, just send me a friend request and just say hi. I was watching you on Kathy's show. Um, can you please add me as a friend? Um, and I do that every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. How long do you go usually? 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Short set. Yeah. Um, and there's no breaks. You know, I talk sometimes, but it's usually just, you know, and I will have my pieces in there. Some things will be improvised. Some things will be very heavily electronic. Um, but it's it kind of just goes straight for 25 minutes and then that's it, which is my preferred length of time for a set. You know, I think it's a, a perfect amount of time, so. It's usually about four or five pieces. And on my YouTube channel and all my social media, I leave every show. So you can watch them week to week and see all the different things. <clears throat> could we could we pop in just a little bit here towards the end of the show here? Sure. Um, <clears throat> because I, I loved what we listened to in the beginning. That was great. Sure. Yeah, just uh, we used to call it dropping the needle, you know. Um, any of these... Yeah, anything. I would pick the top. I would. I really like this first show, like the one that you were playing before. I really. Yeah. I think that one came out really well. If you go from the middle or towards the end of that, it should be pretty cool. Okay, I think it's going to pick up from where I left off. <clears throat> yeah, this is a good. That's a good place to take.
Okay, well, I think that people should continue listening to this, you know. Sure. It's really um, fantastic. And <clears throat> um, da -da 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 that's the one. Yeah, it's a great song. Um, so I want to thank you for being on. Oh, thank um, you for having me. Yeah, it's I miss, really nice I miss you. seeing you in person. I know. You're one of the nicest musicians ever. You always Aww. invite me to shows. And it was really, yeah, very, you know, nice relationship. Likewise. Likewise. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, so people should uh, check you out on Tuesday nights. Anything else that they should be looking for? Um, I have two new albums. I have an electronic album called Like the Sun, and I have a new album on Steeplechase that just came out with my sextet called Power from the Air. Oh, very nice. And where do people go for that? Do they go to your site or somewhere? Any, anywhere. Anywhere. Anywhere, okay. Dan Davila said you have the Keith Emerson sound. Really nice. He He was my big influence. I was actually, I knew him a little bit because uh, we both are endorsed by Hammond and I would see, would see him at the NAMM show. Huh. And we actually played in a concert together yeah. one time. So he's kind of my big keyboard hero. Very cool. See, yeah. see Dan, you really picked up on that. Yeah. That's cool. This kind of sound is like, and that's an analog synthesizer on the top. And he was very famous for these modular analog kind of lead sounds. So that's kind of very up his alley. That's that sound. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> just a word about uh, what's coming up for this show before mm -hmm. we sign off. Uh, thurs this week, Thursday through Sunday, I'm posting archives at noon, same time. <clears throat> Thursday is Nick Mancini, great vibes player. Also I mean, a good friend of mine. I, I know you know I, a bunch of these people, right? I know Afton too. I was I was there when they first, I don't want to say when they first met each other, but I knew Afton when they were first going out and they're a lovely couple, you know. And, and they, they have, have a, a beautiful daughter. I know, I know. And unfortunately, they moved. I think yeah. actually I saw a post today that Afton's, I, I didn't read it thoroughly, but somebody close to her, grandmother or mother. Yes, I saw I saw that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then nice Fri family. Very nice. Great people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Friday is uh, Russell Ferrante, who I know you know. Mr. Oh, his chords. His, tell him his article in Keyboard Mag Magazine, Mr. Goodcord, changed my life. <laughs> well, that's cool. Now, these are archives. These are already done. So. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, Saturday, Peter Eldridge, the singer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful singer. And Sunday, Kiki Wow, who basically does what I do in the community, but in the folk and acoustic rock mm -hmm. community. And then next week, um, the three live people will be Stacy Hoffman, who ran, um, who runs, I guess, the jazz, um, jazz, what's it called? The Jazz Workshop? It's in San Francisco. It's mm -hmm. a jazz camp. Oh, Jazz Camp West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That has, has been going for something like 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tuesday, Jason Harnell. Do you know him? Mm hmm you should know Jason Harnell. He's he's another one of these great drummers, musicians here in L.A. who's just mm -hmm. plays with, you know, all the people like Larry mm -hmm. Coons people. And yeah, he's mm -hmm. wonderful. And then Wednesday, a singer who I got turned on to through Dave Liebman, Nancy Reed. Mm -hmm. Wonderful singer. Great singer. So those are the three live people coming up next week. Sounds like great, great guests. Yeah. And anyone in L.A., if the weather you know, changes because now it's kind of, it looks like it's going to rain. Uh, mm -hmm. I Saturday night, I will be playing at um, the conference room in Playa Vista, six to nine with Brad Rebuchin on guitar and John Leftwich on bass and Aaron Sefferty on drums. And it's, uh, I'll do the first set and then I'll open it up for jamming, which is, works out really good. So I hope people come out. It's outdoors. And uh, it's a very safe environment, and the food is great. Lock, lots of parking. But <clears throat> I warn you, if you've never been there before, you should look at my website for directions because it's very challenging to find. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, okay, Brian, 
thanks again for being here. Really enjoyed my pleasure. The great, to, great to see you. Great. Thanks yeah. for having me on the show. Great to hear your oh, music. Hello again, and too. love to all my LA friends. I hope I can see you soon. All right. Bye, everybody.